Next up is uh, Jen, right? Okay, Jen Troyer uh, is going to give us the uh, presentation on the concept non-human primate, primate developmental GTEx. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Troyer. I'm a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences. And I'm presenting um, this for a, a group from um, both NHGRI and NICHD um, that has been working on thinking about the areas in developmental genomics that we all um, have a common interest in. And I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues in um, throughout ERP and our division directors for many helpful comments um, in preparing this. So the purpose of non-human primate developmental DGTEx is really to study gene expression patterns for multiple reference tissues across stages in different non-human primates and compare these to gene expression patterns in humans. This will allow us to determine co common developmental networks and pathways, as well as ones that are primate and human specific. Um, it will establish data sets and samples for comparative developmental genomics and inform model selection for functional follow-up and studies of particular developmental processes. This follows on several other genotype tissue expression projects, um, GTEx, that was mentioned in Eric's director's report and um, has, is a successful common fund program that is now completed and recently, as Eric highlighted, published on 838 postmortem adults, 49 tissues, DNA and RNA seq methods. And this is a highly um, used and utilized resource that has helped us understand tissue specific gene expression profiles, as well as really pioneered the field of EQTLs. Jody came to you last year with a proposal for developmental GTEx, which is a collaborative project between NHGRI and ICHD and some of the institutes and center centers interested in the development of brain. Um, and this is a project that is now under review and plans to collect um, tissues from 120 postmortem infants and children and again, provide DNA and RNA-seq as well as some single cell RNA data. Um, again, to further our understanding of tissue specific expression at different developmental stages and that are developmentally regulated as well as some single cell type specific expression. And to really further our understanding of the impact of variation on development. So what I'm proposing today is in addition to that, looking at um, developmental pathways in non-human primates, this will allow comparable and parallel data sets in experimentally tractable laboratory animals and um, allow us to extend this knowledge to prenatal as well as postnatal stages of development, as well as building on our knowledge that has been obtained over the years from model organisms. Just to touch on that, we there's a vast array of resources um, and knowledge that's been obtained from looking at development across many different organisms um, and as well as the developmental genomics. If you start with worm and sea urchin, where there are detailed cell fate maps from single cell to adult stages, um, moving on to fruit flies and zebra fish that have given us understanding of the regulatory networks that lay down complex body patterning um, for organisms and then into frog and mouse where we have more understanding of specific organs and their development and stages throughout. So now we're proposing to continue these studies into non-human primates. Um, these are our closest relatives. And um, if you look, the closest organism where we have detailed information is really the mouse, which evolved 800 to 100 million years ago from us. Um, and if we move into non-human primates, we get closer with 40 million years ago for new world monkeys, 25 million years ago for old world milk 
monkeys. Um, in addition to being closer relatives, importantly, they have similar developmental trajectories to humans with more development occurring postnatally, um, particularly for things like um, behavioral processes and immunity. Many of the things have, are, are used as model systems. In addition, Primates have genomic diversity, even in the captive populations that are used in biomedical research, have a high level of diversity that makes them good models for human population studies. They are used as biomedical models for many things from, as I said, immune system to um, morphology to brain development um, and drug sensitivity. And so they're understanding their similarities and difference from human from humans in these processes is quite important. Um, and they provide comparative genomics, um, particularly touch points between some of the model organisms and humans. So what we're proposing today is that um, we fund one to two centers that would be responsible for collecting expression data. And I'll go a little more into that in the next slide. Um, these would be funded at approximately 3.5 million per year over five years, um, would collect data from multiple developmental stages, tissues, and species. They would be responsible for making the data available and usable to the community. And we would ask that they use opportunistic and bank samples wherever possible. What would this look like? So we're asking for samples to come from a minimum number of species for us, at least two old and new world monkeys um, at at least six developmental stages that would span prenatal and postnatal, 12 animals per stage um, that would have a balance between males and females, and again, at least 30 tissues per animal. The data that would be generated, again, would be the whole genome sequence for the animal and then expression data for each of the tissues. Um, certainly other assays could be proposed and there would be a data management component that would involve QC, some basic analysis and then submission to the appropriate resources. Standing this up from scratch would be um, quite a big endeavor, but we would assume that applicants will leverage the um, non-human primate resources that are already funded through the Primate Resource Center Consortium. There are seven of these centers supported by the Office of Research and Infrastructure Programs. And these have colonies from 10 different primate species, all of which have genomic resources. They know the level of genomic diversity, the relatedness of the animals. They maintain high ethical standards for primate research and um, many of the animals have behavioral and phenotypic data available. Both the primate resource centers and others have extensive banked tissue sample collections that may be appropriate for some of these studies. And there is the ability to leverage the um, high quality reference genomes that NHGRI funded as part of the reference genome program. The other part of this is not only should they collaborate and be um, talking to the non-human primate resources, but also to the human developmental GTEx. Um, as I said, these are under review right now, but it's proposed that there will be tissue procurement centers and a data analysis and coordinating center that will be performing essentially analogous um, tissue collections and data generation and analyses that will, um, in humans, that would be now proposed to do also in non-human primates. And so it would be important that these groups are working closely together for protocol standards um, and interoperability. As with any program, there are considerations of balance and certainly here there's multi-dimensional data with many axes, this different stages, individuals, tissues, assays, species. Um, and then anytime you're generating this amount of data, there's the question of providing it as a resource and with developing new or 
integrating with existing resources and potentially the need for new data analysis methods. So we're going to ask um, Council's input on this concept and I've asked Len Panaccio um, and Steve Fodor and Mark Craven to, to lead us off on the discussion. Um, we welcome comments on any part of this proposal, but the questions I'm particularly going to pose to you to start off is, is this balance right? And um, how do we make sure that if we're producing this resource, we're really maximizing the benefit of these tissues? And are there additional resources, activities going on in the community that we might not know about that we should be coordinating with and thinking about? And so, Len, do you want sure. to Sure. You know, this resonated with me. I mean, I, I have mostly reiteration of things that you said, like the timeliness is great with the human developmental GTEx. Um, I thought the human non-human primates made a ton of sense as an outgroup versus trying to go to other more distant vertebrate models since we're interested in humans. Um, I, I also saw the opportunity to get tissues you couldn't get from humans during development as a real bonus, especially from non-human primates. Um, I thought that this is a pilot project that could potentially be expanded. And so this is uh, something that hopefully will be successful. Um, having only one or two centers makes that a little more tractable. So I thought not expanding it to three or four or beyond. I mean, ideally you probably want two, not one, but, um, it, it seems like the right scale for kind of, you know, it's not a pilot, but something that is a relatively new, um, part to, part to this. Um, so overall, I, I didn't have any concerns. I mean, I, you just brought up at the end, the, the data analysis component, which I'm not real clear on how much, um, comparative. GTEx or this kind of uh, QTL type of analysis uh, tools exist, but it's outside of my area of expertise. So there's probably development that needs to happen there or be called out in the applications themselves. So again, overall, I thought this was something that uh, I didn't really see any major uh, issues with. Thanks. Thanks, Len. And I think you bring up a good point about sort of the scope and is this a pilot? What we're seeing this as really is a baseline of what NHGRI will support, but we are talking to other institutes and centers across the NIH about whether there are parts of it that they're interested in building out on too. And you could see how the bank tissues and the data could be co-opted to, to additional projects in the future. So that's part of making sure that we're, we're planning this in such a way that it can be built upon. So Jay, you want me to go? Yeah. Can so, I go next, please? Yeah, so I, you know, I, think I agree. This is a really important um, uh, program. And I also agree with many of the comments that have already been made. Um, it's, it's important both as a program and a resource in an area where, you know, samples are scarce and precious. And although these aren't human, they're still scarce and precious. And to that end, you know, as I understand it, the sample collection from great apes and so on won't really be supported through this. Um, but instead, the leveraging of samples that may be used for other purposes or banked and so on will be preferred, I guess. Um, that's one of the questions I wanted to talk to you or just ask you a little bit about. But with that in mind, you know, my sort of two comments are, um, you know, there's been a, you know, gene expression is a big field these days. And there's a lot of new advances. You did mention the emphasis on things like single cell would be emphasized. I think that's really good. Uh, but it, with precious samples, you know, the um, there's certainly the spatially resolved single cell type stuff. Um, I think that would be very useful. Uh, in addition, um, you know, a lot of recent work on, on uh, RNA modifications and implications of development and so on would also be good. And so, you know, there's a lot to be thinking about what your standards or data um, should be in this instead of sort of the old days where we just ground up everything and got a potpourri, it'd be nice to get higher resolution on these if possible. And that kind of goes along with the value of these samples also is to be very thoughtful about how to use them. The other uh, general question, and this is just food for thought, 
is can a program like this be used to sort of inspire some technology development, you know, such as non-invasive or, or maybe non-lethal <laughs> sample acquisitions, especially in, you know, these areas where you've got a lot of ethical concerns. So that's kind of food, food for thought, but I'm very supportive of the program. Thanks, Steve. No, those are great ideas and, and great things to think about. Um, and so I don't think there was a, a real question there, but I'm going to go back to this question of, of sort of the banked samples first versus freshly collected. And I, and I think that that is a really important point. And one of the reasons we say at least two, as you could imagine, where even for some of the grade eight, somebody has banked these samples from past studies that might provide really relevant data. Um, and it would be use it not doing anything invasive. Um, certainly, I think we'd be very open and could think about building into the RFA some ability for people to do non-invasive sampling as well. Or I guess it would be invasive, but not, as you say, non-lethal. Okay, Mark. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I'm very excited about the program as well. And I think my major comment had to do with the, the parameters of sampling. So at, as you describe the ideas, you look at two species and six developmental stages and 12 animals at each stage, I think, and 30 tissues. And um, as, I, as I indicated in some email, I guess it, I think it'd be worth thinking about letting, having the, the centers propose experimental designs. Right, so that that you know, in this parameter space, as the data is being gathered, it could also be driven by power calculations or other analyses indicating where you're going to get the most informative sampling at, as you go. Um, and and I guess I had questions also about you know whether the samples were coming from those the tissue banks or opportunistically from animals that die or whatever, because that also might suggest some kind of adaptive type procedure where you're also deciding what, what to assay depending on what opportunities to present. So that's just one area for thought. Um, I, one really minor comment is, is that it, in the, the concept, there's a, a mention that in later years, you will be soliciting um, uh, proposals for statistical methods to analyze the data and I would just encourage you to broaden that language to statistical and computation or something that's just a little more encompassing. And then I also had a question, which is that for developmental GTEx, there are more institute partners and mental health, I think, and, and um, NINDS. And so are there possibilities to get more partners beefing up this project here? Yeah, I'll answer that part first, which is yes. Um, so NICHD has expressed some enthusiasm and we're talking to both mental health and, and, and INDS um, and also the Office of Research Infrastructure Programs. Um, I'll also be presenting a similar thing to the trans NIH um, non-human primate working group to try and see if other ICs are interested as well. And I think they might be. Okay, Trey. Yeah, so I, I too am very supportive of the idea of a developmental GTEx. In, in fact, I was thinking of multiple times in the past six months where I've been on some research conference call and someone pipes up, you know, wouldn't it be great if we just had GTEx for development, you know? And so, so I think it's, it's very much needed. Um, and of course, there are some resources that, that overlap, but nothing of, of the ambition you propose. Um, Given the, the sort of armchair um, uh, interpretation of what you're proposing, it seems to have not one, but several more dimensions than GTEx. So, so it's not just across tissues. That was the key thing that, you know, that the GTEx, of course, did. But now you're adding to that a species component and a time component. So it's, it's certainly more complex. Could you just give us your analysis of, of how these, these extra dimensions reflect on the budget and scope of this versus the original GTEx? You must be cutting something that the original GTEx did, 
or else this budget is going to have to be much larger it, or, you know, the scope is going to have to be larger. So how yeah, do you think about right. that? That's a, that's a really good point. And that is sort of this balance of if you increase by one dimension, you have to increase, decrease by others if you're going to stay real. Yeah, so could you compare yeah. against GTEx, I guess? Uh, so, so the difference here really is sample number. So both for developmental GTEx and humans, what's proposed and now what we're proposing in the non-human primates, we're really looking at pretty small numbers of individuals, whereas GTEx has that 900 um, and could do some in, then important statistical analyses. And I think that in these smaller studies, we're really honing in on large differences between your stages and between your tissues um, and not going to be have subtle effects. Um, and in addition, it's sort of the exploratory space to say, where do we want to look deeper? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, was the original GTEx scope 900 samples? It was fewer, was it not? Um, I don't know if Simona is, or, or Jyoti is able to speak to that. I don't know what was originally scoped out for the original GTEx. Is anybody on who can speak to that? Jody? Yeah, um, I don't know what the original, I know um, the the final was uh, 906, they recruited 965 donors and collected over around 53 tissues. The, the original, original aim was a thousand. So they came close. Uh, so sorry, Simona has has piped in the pilot was 180 and then they expanded it to the close to 1000. Okay, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, I, on that point, Trey, I just also wanted to note that the other dimension that's uh, that's advanced, I think, from the original GTEx program is relates to Steve Fodor's part about the most recent assays, sort of the type of you know, assays and analysis that you can do is becoming a little bit more expansive as well and yet another dimension on top of sort of GTEx, which had the strong focus on bulk RNA sequencing. Go ahead, Jonathan. So uh, two comments. One one is that I I would look at this as this, this is a pilot. This is an essentially exploratory. Can this actually work? And I would hope that if it does, that it could then be expanded because the sample sizes are, are small. So, you know, let's hope it works and that we can get more, more data because the, the amount of data that's going to come out of this, while it could be really, really useful, I'm sure people are going to come back and say, but we really, you know, we could use five times as much, right? And then, you know, then, then you have to worry about the budget. Um, the other, I think I wanted to follow up, I think it was Mark that, that made the comment about the, the statistical and computational analysis that it was, that, that, that was going to be down the road a little bit. I worry that if that, if, if people aren't thinking about that, when the study designs are made, that it can have an impact on, on, on how things are done. It, it, this goes back to the classic problem with anyone who does biostatistics and they're brought into the, the game late, and then they have to try to figure out how to analyze data that was not designed, the study design was not good for any, any sort of analysis. So I would just encourage, maybe, maybe it's not a, a grant per se, but clearly the analytical part of this needs to be thought of early in the game. Very good point, Jonathan. And I think some language to that effect can be put in the RFA. Other questions or comments? For this concept. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the concept? A second? Second. All in favor, raise your hands. Five, four, three, two, one. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen.